all of our co-sponsors who co-sponsored um, the majority leader, Amanda Freyes, um, Councilman Che Osei, Althea Stevens, Alexa Avellis, Lincoln Ressler, uh, Shaker Krishnan, and Rita Joseph, thank you for your solidarity and being there with us and connecting with our community. Muslim Day at City Hall is about making sure that our communities are well-funded and well-supported. There are so many issues that are impacting our community from mental health issues to the migrants that our organizations are supporting to the language barriers that our communities are facing. And so we hope uh, that this budget cycle, that our organizations will get the funding that they need to support all of these communities. Um, I wanna thank everybody for, for being here again. I'm gonna pass it on to Hiba. We're gonna hear some remarks from some of our city council members who've joined, and then you'll be hearing from all of our community members um, who are part of the coalition to uh, provide us an understanding of what their needs are uh, in this budget cycle. Thank you. Thank you again so much to all of our partners who are here today who have supported this effort with us. Um, I think this is the this is the fourth year in a row for Muslim Day at City Hall, and this year we have twenty five coalition partners who have joined us. I'm going to pass it to our council members who are here joining us today to give a few remarks and then we'll start our virtual briefing. Um, we'll start with council member Krishnan. Thank you again for being here with us today. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's so nice to see you all. Thank you so much, Hiba. Thank you so much, Dr. Debbie. Um, and it is truly, historic to be celebrating the fourth World Muslim Day um, at City Hall, um, which is such, especially in such heartbreaking times too, such a powerful statement of the power, the vibrancy, the solidarity from our Muslim community and beyond. I'm proud, I'm Council Member Shaker Krishnan, representing Jackson Heights and Elmhurst, Queens, and really proud to represent such a thriving Muslim community here in my district too, especially as one of the first South Asians ever elected to our city council. Here in Jackson Heights, Elmhurst, we have especially an incredible uh, Bangladeshi community that continues to grow in the strength of its voice every single day. Um, and so many things that we think about here in New York City that we can do to make sure that our Muslim communities are seen, that our voices are heard, um, that our issues are uplifted, uh, is an ongoing uh, uh, a fight that we face. And so, you know, here in, in our neighborhood, I've been proud to work with our Muslim communities to do things to lift up our small business owners, uh, to celebrate our cultures, to make sure that we renamed, for example, 73rd Street, Bangladesh Street here in Jackson Heights to recognize how historic it is for a Bangladeshi community to broader fights across um, our school, including, as Dr. Debbie mentioned too, making sure in our city council, we had record funding for anti-hate initiatives to fight Islamophobia that we are seeing rising in a very scary way across our city, across our country. And so the work that we have, I think, ahead of us with Engage and all of us is to continue on that path to make sure that our Muslim communities not only feel safe, but that our cultures, our religion, our uh, food, languages, everything are celebrated, are flourishing, are uplifted, and that all communities are showing solidarity with our Muslim community, especially in this time too. So I wanna thank you all so much for, for having us on. I'm proud to work with you all too in our city council to make sure that we continue to support for and make sure we have resources for our Muslim communities here in Elmer Jacksonites in Queens and across New York City. Thank you so much. And we're gonna pass it to council member Avelas who's also here joining us. Good morning, everyone. I'm Council Member Alexa Aviles, representing District 38 in South Brooklyn. That includes the neighborhoods of Sunset Park and Red Hook, uh, Borough Park and Bensonhurst and Diker Heights, um, among others. Um, I'm just here in solidarity. Congratulations to all the organizations that are part of today's fourth annual um, Muslim Day. Um, I just want to say I'm here in solidarity um, as the newly appointed chair to the Immigration Committee and City Council. Um, I will be standing with you. We will be fighting for increased resources uh, for legislation that supports and protects our communities. And, you know, I just have to say um, what we have been seeing recently around this, these notions of an immigrant crime wave is deeply, deeply concerning because 
that just means there's a crime wave in New York City while essentially immigrants are New York City and there is no such thing. There's no correlation of crime in immigrant communities and you scapegoat one community, you scapegoat us all. Um, and so we're here to continue to push through these narratives, continue to support being a sanctuary city and the dignity and the safety with which those policies, which were crafted by many on this call um, and upheld by many on this call will continue to remain in place. And so here in solidarity to continue to fight for the rights and dignity of the Muslim community and all New Yorkers. So thank you so much for your work. Thank you so much, council member. And with that, we're going to pass it to our one of our primary sponsors, um, council member Shahana Hanif. Thank you so much, Hiba, and Samadikum, everyone. Thank you for joining us on our fourth annual Muslim Day. Uh, and I wanna just extend my gratitude to Mgage for your strength and your organizing power in making sure that uh, our Muslim-led organizations and organizations serving Muslim populations and communities uh, have a direct line to our elected officials, that our colleagues understand what the biggest needs are that are impacting Muslim communities in all corners of the city. I just came from the, uh, the rally uh, in the city hall steps. And I was um, really taken aback by just the emphasis on the need for a ceasefire. And I applaud every single Muslim led organization, our Muslim leadership in making that demand pronounced and a part of today's Muslim day. Um, we know that um, Muslims right now who are taking their fight and advocacy to the streets uh, are being profiled, are being targeted, are being bullied and harassed by the police. Um, so surveillance, ending surveillance, um, protecting our civil liberties, um, and making sure that we are holding police accountable will continue to be um, uh, priorities for the Muslim community. I also wanna acknowledge the work uh, that several uh, Muslim uh, organizations have done to ensure that uh, we were successful, that the city council was successful in overriding uh, two vetoes, um, one banning solitary confinement and two um, uh, making our police department more transparent. Uh, and to see Muslim organizations like Muslim Community Network to be a part of the fold of that fight makes me really proud uh, because we know that all of these issues impact Muslims and even issues that might not directly impact Muslims, we know that they impact New Yorkers and Muslims care about New Yorkers. And so thank you so much for your organizing, for bringing us together once more in the fight to expand uh, funding allocations for our, our organizations to ensure that we're providing adequate and efficient services um, and driving policy. Um, a, a, a piece of legislation that is about to pass this afternoon um, has been supported by organizations like um, the Asia Women's Center. Uh, we are about to pass my legislation that would provide free lock changes to survivors of domestic violence. Um, so I applaud the work of the um, Muslim-led anti-domestic violence organizations, gender justice groups, um, for keeping their ears and eyes on the ground and, and working in close collaboration with legislators like myself to move on critical pieces of legislation that supports all survivors of gender-based and domestic uh, violence. Um, and I know that we have work to do uh, to reintroduce um, another one of my pieces of legislation uh, to expand religious diversity in our public schools um, with the uptick in bullying and the lack of understanding um, uh, even among educators and administrators is really harming many, many Muslim students, but also students across the faith. Um, so I'm proud to work in partnership and I look forward to, uh, to making sure that today is a success for all of our partners who are participating. Thank you so much, Sister Debbie and Heba. Back to you. Thank you so much, Council Member Hanif. We also have Council Member Linda Lee, who is here to join us and show solidarity with our community. And um, Council Member? Is Nishu, is Nishu um, getting her on? Mm -hmm.
Do we have council member Linda Lee with us? She's, she didn't flip her over yet. Okay. Nishu, can you actually give her access to be a panelist? Yeah, I invited her to be a panelist right now. She is unmuted, so Hi. I think she's about to start speaking. So sorry. Wonderful. Hi, can you all hear me? I'm so sorry about the technical difficulties still. <laughs> no worries. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Go ahead, Linda. We can hear you. Sorry, can you hear me? I think I had to it, let me rejoin as a panelist. <laughs> yes, yes, we let you. Okay, yes, we perfect. can hear you. I'm so sorry about that. Um, no, so I just wanted to say thank you, first of all, to Dr. Debbie for always um, including us on these and hosting these important panel discussions um, to talk about issues that are really, really impacting the Muslim community. Um, and as you mentioned, Dr. Debbie, in the beginning, um, Islamophobia is rampant, and we've seen upticks of that. And in my district, in District 23, out in Eastern Queens, which most people would not think is diverse, actually has a very large and growing Muslim pop uh, population and community. And we've been being, uh, we've trying to be, we're trying to be very intentional in bringing them more into the fold, giving them a seat at the table, because as uh, folks that have been part of a lot of the minority communities and done work, like, for example, for myself in the AAPI community for many years, we know that a lot of our issues oftentimes are not discussed or are unseen or ignored. And so for myself and others on the council um, and who were on this panel speaking, I just wanted to really echo the sentiments that we want to be here to be that voice, not just in words and say we're going to stand by the community, but really show action, whether it's um, giving more of a platform to our local community groups, um, helping them with funding, giving them um, you know, more opportunities to be part of the conversation and influence legislation and what's happening in our districts, um, and having more people be involved in local government, like our community boards and our civics. I think that's important because we need to make sure that there's representation at every level, because I do think there's a lot of misinformation, misunderstanding um, about the communities that we're talking about. And so the what we can do, and I think the very least that we can do is offer up a voice and an opportunity um, for folks in our Muslim communities to, to be part of the solution and not just to have other people talk at them, but have us work with the communities around us and in our districts. and. And I, I just wanted to really thank all of you for bringing this to the attention of, um, you know, for the fourth annual uh, Muslim Day, uh, you know, for us to keep bringing awareness and attention. And, you know, whether it's in our schools or other places of gathering in our communities, I think we need to really continue the conversation and educate and uplift actually a lot of the positive things about our communities and culture so that the bullying and the hate and all of the things that we're seeing right now um, at a very young age have to be talked about and, and addressed so that we can try to help foster much more understanding. And so, you know, whatever uh, we can do to help, um, and as I believe uh, Council Member Krishnan mentioned with the anti eight uh, initiative funding, as well as the AAPI initiative funding, a lot of those fundings uh, will go to um, our broader communities and hopefully will help in addressing some of the issues that we're seeing on the ground. So I just wanted to, again, thank Engage, Thank you, Dr. Debbie, and all the work that went into putting this together. And we look forward to just having an amazing discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, we will start with our presentation that includes us and some of our wonderful partners that have worked so hard with us over the past several weeks uh, to put this together. One of the biggest issues that we're seeing across the city is the impact of Islamophobia. We are asking the New York City Council to join the other 47 cities that have passed ceasefire resolutions to help mitigate the impact of Islamophobia on our community. One of the biggest things that we're also facing is the fear of retaliation for solidarity with Palestine among Muslim and pro-Palestine activists since October 7th. Islamophobia has impacted our community and those perceived to be Muslim 
at a frightening rate in all aspects of public life. Health, hospitals, clinics, education, K through 12, colleges and universities, law enforcement biases when reporting hate crimes, and the lack of information to Muslim communities about what constitutes a hate crime and how to report it. According to CARE New York, 43% of hate complaints received by um, <clears throat> received to them are related to anti-Palestinian violence. In 2023, CARE received 555 complaints of hate and bias. Um, and just to put shine a light on this, these numbers are highly underreported because the numbers are not capturing all of the reporting that's happening due to lack of reporting by NYPD and also the hesitancy to come forward when a hate crime happens to law enforcement. Um, we're also seeing um, institutional perpetuation of Islamophobic tropes by media and elected officials. This is happening across the country. It's happening here in New York City. We just came out, there are two articles that just came out, both in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal that reinforce Muslim tropes. Um, and we're seeing this really impact communities across districts in the city. And with that, I'm going to pass it to Hussein Yadaberi, who can elaborate on the impact of Islamophobia in communities and in education. All right. Next slide. Hi, my name is Hussein Yadaberry. I'm the executive director of Muslim Community Network, and I'm here to discuss the rise in Islamophobia and hate crimes. So I want to discuss violence prevention, safety, and community development. Um, these 12 organizations across the city are all part of a coalition in order to effectively fight hate crimes against Muslims in our fair city. Um, great. So I wanted to talk about community and the education today um, and my capacity as executive director of Muslim Community Network, but also as a representative voice for a community that finds itself at a critical juncture in our city's rich tapestry of diversity and resilience. Our gathering here transcends routine civic engagement. It's a solemn assembly compelled by a distressing surge in hate crimes across our state and city. A surge underscored by Governor Hochul's report of a 90% increase in hate crimes. Yet it's crucial to remember that these are not mere statistics. Behind every number lies a story of fear, of sorrow, and shattered peace for Muslim New Yorkers. Imagine for a moment that the compounded effect of these numbers, considering the vast majority of such incidents remain undocumented, hidden in the shadows of fear and silence. Our community faces an onslaught of Islamophobia anti-Arab sentiment tied to Palestine and anti-Blackness and xenophobia that particularly affects our migrant communities from Africa and all across the world. The fabric of our society woven from threads of mutual respect and understanding seem to be unraveling in front of our very eyes. The digital realm, a space that promises connectivity and knowledge has morphed into a battleground where hate speech against Muslims has spiked at a, by an astonishing 417%. The online vitriol, not only perpetuates stereotypes, but also infringes upon the fundamental First Amendment rights of Muslim New Yorkers, challenging the very principles upon which our nation was founded. In the streets, the echoes of unrest are palpable, with over 483 protests recorded in relation to the situation in Gaza. It's clear that the international turmoil has profound local reverberations. These protests are not mere statistics, they are a voice of a community calling for justice, for understanding, and for peace. But they have been met with hundreds of arrests, police aggression, and public threats. Our response to this climate of fear and misunderstanding has been swift and unwavering. As many of the council members have stated, community-based organizations and grassroots movements have doubled their efforts conducting community safety trainings and promoting diversity education in schools and institutions. These initiatives are vital, aimed at dismantling negative stereotypes and fostering a culture of inclusivity and respect. Yet, despite these commendable efforts, we are continually hamstrung by a lack of resources and funding, a legacy of systemic failures and deep-seated mistrust that traces back to the dark days of September 11th. The fragile trust that was painstakingly rebuilt over the years was shattered anew 
leaving our community to navigate a landscape of uncertainty and fear. The increase in anti-Muslim incidents, particularly in the educational settings, is a distressing indicator of the challenges we face. Our students, the future of our city, endure derogatory remarks and actions that no child should ever face. Organizations like CARE have documented cases of hijab pullings, unfound accusations of terrorism um, among student populations, highlighting a dire need of support and services for Muslim students within our Department of Education and our CUNY systems and college systems at large. Doxing trucks around college campuses and online attacks of Muslim students and their allies have been prevalent over the past few months with no reprieve. Our recommendations are both a plea and a roadmap for change. We call for an establishment of trusted community forums to collect comprehensive data on hate crimes against Muslims. This data is not just numbers, it is key to understanding the vast geographies, languages, and challenges our communities faces, um, allowing us to strategize effectively against hate. As Councilwoman Hanif mentioned, Resolution 476, which calls for consultation with faith-based organizations around religious diversity, um, represents a beacon of hope. Its passage, along with the support of state legislation mandating hate crime awareness education, would mark a significant step forward in our collective journey towards understanding and respect. We plan to work with the council to link our resolution with Assembly Bill 243 and State Senate Bill 6871 that requires hate crime awareness curriculum and instructions for school districts that covers racial hate and religious hate. Furthermore, we urge um, the council to adopt policies for the NYPD to take on cultural sensitivity training tailored to the Muslim communities and to report religious bias complaints with the seriousness, the seriousness they deserve. It is not just about recognizing bias, it's about understanding the deep wounds such bias can inflict. We urge policy guardrails to be in place to protect protesters' First Amendment rights as well. This is a core tenet of our country that is being trampled on by police, just like during the 2020 BLM protests. In closing, I call upon each of you to consider the principle of our faith called Ummah, our shared human community. It is a reminder that despite our differences, we are bound by a common thread of humanity. I urge each individual to publicly call for ceasefire. I urge you to support a citywide ceasefire, not as a mere symbolic gesture, but as a concrete action towards lowering the tensions that have simmered in our community. Such a stance affirming the value of every life can transform the narrative and signal to every New Yorker that they are being heard, they are valued, and that they belong. It's a pivotal moment for our city, a chance to reaffirm our commitment to diversity, inclusion, and peace. Let us seize the opportunity to stand together against hatred and to forge a future where every citizen can live without fear, embraced by the true spirit of New York City. Over 47 cities have been able to affirm their communities with ceasefire resolution. Let New York City be the next. Thank you for your time and your empathy. I'm going to pass it on to my brother Yusuf to talk about how Islamophobia affects our merchants and small businesses. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you, uh, Brother Hassan. And uh, thank you for everyone uh, who's joining us on this Muslim Day at City Hall. My name is Yusuf Mubarez, and I am a member of the Yemeni American Merchants Association and the president of Yama Action. And I'm here not just to represent the 5,000 Yemeni American businesses, but the over 100,000 Muslim businesses in New York today. Um, 100,000 businesses that are feeling the pain of what's going on today, but you know, do their best to mask their uh, political opinions or, or any personal things they have to do what they do best, which is serving their community. And believe me, it's not easy. Um, you know, these days the, the small business owners are, uh, you know, feeling the effects of a huge surge of armed robberies, break-ins, uh, retail theft, which is a huge problem. Um, right now, the es it's estimated that financial losses have been around $300 million, um, about 63,000 retail theft complaints have been made by mom and pop stores, uh, bodegas, supermarkets, and, and these are not your smash and grabs in the big uh, chain stores. These are regular hard work community members who, when 
baby formula is stolen or laundry detergent is stolen and their margins are so small and the price of that is very expensive, they're hurting, right? They're hurting for their families here, um, but also for their families back home. Um, what, they're, what they face after that is when they do, um, you know, confront the assailant or, or somebody who, who's stealing from them, they're worried about an escalation of violence and, you know, hearing the words that they hate to hear the most, which is, I'll be back or we'll be back. And when they do report it, they're, they're worried about any the delays or, or inadequate responses by law enforcement. Um, a lot of the times they show up two hours later um, and, you know, it's, it's really hard to uh, address the situation when the goods were stolen and, and you know, the thief left. So there's a pressing need for violence prevention so that when these situations do happen, the store owner knows what to do and, and you know, it doesn't escalate. Another big issue um, is, you know, besides retail theft uh, being on the rise, it has not been addressed since COVID. Uh, you know, one of my family members, Delis on 10th Street and 1st Avenue, shut after COVID because of, uh, you know, retail theft, but, uh, uh, more issues and they haven't opened since. Um, another big issue is limited access to security equipment. Uh, everything's expensive. Cameras are expensive. Gates are expensive. Uh, getting permits for all of these are expensive. So it's it's just really hard for these small business owners to, to protect themselves and protect their businesses and protect their families. Well, you know, what I want to say is the, the repercussion of that is, is very important to New York City because the bodega is the 24-7 business. And it's the reason why New York is a city that never sleeps. So without the bodegas that never sleep, you know, we'll lose that nickname. We'll lose that, that idea about New York City. And that's something we can't give up. Uh, next slide, please. So here's some of the solutions we've come up with. We obviously want to allocate funding for prime, crime prevention training for our bodega owners, uh, uh, you know, community work with the actual nonprofits on the ground who have been working with these small business owners, uh, provide funding for better cameras, uh, you know, stronger gates, stronger security systems. Right now, uh, a lot of these systems or, or funding are allocated by the NYPD. And the issue with our community members is you know, you can imagine them not why they wouldn't want to take a camera from NYPD, just, you know, with a little bit of mistrust, they, they're, they'd they rather take it from the, the nonprofits who are on the ground doing the work for them. Um, some legislation uh, we want to introduce, number one, preventing the sale, resale of stolen goods. Uh, most of these organized crime rings know exactly where to go when they steal the product and how much money they can get for it. And you know, those crime rings have warehouses where they store the product and sell it and make millions of dollars. Um, introduce legislation to penalize repeat offenders. Uh, you heard Mayor Adams say it before, but in, in 2022, 327 were responsible for 30% of New York City's 22,000 retail thefts. So 327 people were responsible for about 7,500 retail thefts in 2022. And it was similar in 2023. Um, you know, another form of legislation we believe will help is to protect these bodega owners. These were essential workers during COVID. These were essential workers during Hurricane Sandy. I mean, every crisis in New York City, they're the ones who step up and make sure that the city has what they need. So, you know, protect them, make harsher penalties if they are affected or, or, or deal with violence. And the last thing is, you know, providing an education training for these small businesses, uh, you, know, you know, teach them what to do when somebody's in their store causing a problem, but also teach the community how to work with their uh, local businesses and what they mean to them so that, you know, we can combat Islamophobia and bias against these Muslim owned businesses, um, make them feel like they're important. We saw the street fender of Hussein on 80, 80th and 2nd was, you know, constantly harassed by Stuart Seldowitz. And when the community came together and boosted his business, I mean, the morale was exponential at that point. That's what we want to see more. 
Um, so thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And now I'd like to introduce Sister Salma Muhammad from Malika. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Salma Mohammed. I am the Advocacy and Organizing Manager at Melika, an anti-violence and wellness organization. I will be presenting on issue area two, migrant support and integration services. Next slide, please. So we have 14 organizations in this area. Next slide, please. So we're seeing migrants are experiencing higher rates of food and housing insecurity, health disparities, legal challenges, and much more. Uh, there's also a lack of necessary culturally responsive, linguistically accessible, and trauma-informed services for migrants. There's a lack of support services for especially vulnerable migrants, such as women and children. And overburdened community-based organizations are on the front lines of responding to this crisis with little to no funding. Uh, for example, Malika worked with 800 asylum seekers um, in the past few months, uh, providing wraparound case management and food distribution with zero dollars in funding. Um, a few weeks ago, a three month year, a three month year old, uh, uh, three month old, excuse me, uh, died in a shelter a few weeks ago. This represents um, the need is really dire and urgent to protect migrants and their families. Next slide, please. So in terms of our recommendations, um, our budget recommendation is to allocate funding for organizations to support the influx of migrants and to continue to provide ongoing services to pre-migrant clients to address immigration service needs, housing needs, and food insecurity. In terms of legislative, uh, we're recommending that um, the council introduce and pass legislation to require the mayor's office on immigrant affairs to establish a secure and confidential online portal and written resource guide of available services for immigrants in New York City um, in designated citywide languages. Um, we're also uh, asking that uh, community-based organizations are included in federal advocacy around TPS and work permits. Uh, we're asking uh, that the council reintroduce and co-sponsor intro uh, 1212, prohibiting the Department of Social Services and others from imposing a length of stay restriction um, on any type of shelter. And um, lastly, in terms of our policy asks, we're um, asking that the council continue to advocate to Mayor Adams to restore New York City's right to shelter and include migrants in housing subsidy programs to grant them access to housing vouchers. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it to Dia to present issue area three language access. Good morning, everyone. I'm the Basu Sen, Executive Director of SUPNA NYC, um, and I will be talking about language access today. Addressing language access issues and providing linguistically accessible services are an essential part of almost all of our community-based organizations. We have 10 organizations currently doing significant work in this area, but it's really something that all of our organizations do to some extent as well. One of the reasons CBOs like SUPNA and these other organizations in our coalition are so important is because New York City's immigrant communities speak over 200 languages, and that's not counting many of the dialects that are spoken. While major strides have been made in terms of language access, there is still significant work that must be done to make sure that we are fulfilling our obligation to immigrant New Yorkers who are essential members of our city. A few years ago, I was tabling at a mental health event to write by City Hall. Someone who I believe was from Health and Hospitals came up to me when she learned that I worked at SUPNA and was really excited to hand me a pin from the We Speak pins that say We Speak Bangla. I went to add it to my tote bag and then I looked at it and I realized it actually didn't say We Speak Bangla because whoever had, I guess, done the final review the, didn't realize that the script had been messed up. Um, so what we should have said, we speak Bangla, didn't actually end up saying anything at all. It was ironic that the very pin that was supposed to represent our city's commitment to language access instead highlighted the very real failings that still exist despite the progress. 
Language accessibility continues to be a crucial issue for immigrant communities in New York City, one that impacts all aspects of our communities' lives and how and if they're able to access social services, from mental health services to food assistance to benefits to community safety. We applaud language local Law 30, language access, is one of the strongest laws in the nation, but also recognize that there are ongoing systemic issues with its implementation that must be addressed so that the intent of the law is truly realized. We have received several reports that translated, translated documents provided by the city are inaccurate, or while the language used is technically accurate, it doesn't necessarily reflect the way the languages are spoken in our communities. As organizations that have deep ties to the people from the community, the organizations that are part of this coalition are the best equipped to provide the nuanced language support and culturally attuned services that are required to truly meet the needs in our community. Yet, while our organizations are often leaned on for linguistic or cultural expertise, these relationships are often not formalized through contracts or funding. Next. On this slide, you will see the specific asks we have in the areas of budget, legislation, and policy. We maintain that the only way to get truly accurate and accessible translation and interpretation is to use the experts that already exist in our immigrant communities, thus providing both better quality language access and opportunities for employment. This ask includes funding for volunteer language banks, community interpreter bank contracts, and continued and expanded funding for the three language service worker cooperatives, which have already begun. It also includes funding CBOs who are already doing much of this work. We ask that the city works with CBOs to identify organizations that are able to provide paid translation services for the city and to use those vendors first when it comes to language access needs. Additionally, while we rely on CBOs to fill the gaps when it comes from everything to food insecurity to assistance for migrants, we're not given access to the resources that exist to better equip our staff. We're asking for free language line services to be made available to all CBO staff so they're better able to serve all of the immigrant communities who come seeking help. And lastly, we ask that city agencies do better when it comes to hiring hiring culturally sensitive and linguistically proficient staff, implementing mandates to ensure that all agencies are meeting the needs of the community. We're also pushing to require New York City agencies to track interpretation requests and whether or not those were made and to publish those numbers biannually for the public and CBOs to see. To wrap up, as we approach Ramadan, I want to emphasize that we're looking for real allyship and solidarity. We don't want iftars and Eid celebrations if those don't also come with policies and funding to support our 1 million New Yorkers, Muslim New Yorkers. If those iftars don't also come with calls for permanent ceasefire and action to address Islamophobia. I'll pass it to, to Sister Heba to, to close out. Thank you so much to all of our amazing presenters. All of our presenters are going to be on standby here for questions from the audience and questions from city council members that are here joining us today. In closing, next slide. We really wanna reiterate um, the issues impacting Muslim communities. They've been exacerbated by the rise in Islamophobia. They've been exacerbated by incoming migrants that need our support as well. We really need to see an increase in discretionary funding and resources for all the community-based organizations that provide services to the influx of migrants and low-income New Yorkers. For legislation, we're really looking to pass Resolution 476, reintroduce and pass Intro 1212, and really think about the implementation of Local Law 30 for immigrant communities across the city. For policy, we're looking to improve cultural sensitivity and competence of city agencies, including the NYPD for Muslim communities, and expand safety and training program offerings to enhance and ensure that our communities are safe. Thank you all so much. So we open it now for Q&A. Um, if any of the council members are on and would like to ask a question about any of the issues, um, the, the budgetary uh, 
part of it or the legislation or um, any of the intros that we discussed, this is a great opportunity to, to ask. We also have some folks with questions in the Q&A box. I don't know if panelists yes. can see them. Um, could you share the program's NYPD funds for retail protection? Um, Yusuf, would you like to take that question? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, no, the, the actual program. Okay. But I can, I can. All right. Um, we just asked Yusuf from the Yemeni American Merchants Association. He doesn't have that information on hand, but he definitely will follow up. Um, and we're happy to send that along to Council Member Sanchez. Thank you for asking. Um, and Council Member Sanchez, if you're still here, at, we do have a couple of minutes. We'll be happy to have you and any other council members that are here to also just give your greetings and solidarity with our community. Any other questions before we do that? Okay, I don't I don't see any um Nishu, nothing on your end. I don't see anything on my end. I think y'all are good to go. Oh, oh wait, I think we just saw a we couple. might have some. Oh, yes, we, we did. <laughs> yes. Um um, so council member uh, Sanchez said the chat is disabled. Um, Sam is there. Okay. Um, then we have an anonymous attendee with the budget challenges the city is facing. Is there an update on where the federal government um, is assisting in the funding for supporting migrants? Um, maybe one of our council members can respond to that. I don't know. I don't know who's still on. Um, okay, for the sake of time, we can certainly get back um, to that person who asked that. Um, obviously, it's been an ongoing struggle in Congress uh, for funding. Any other questions? Karina Sanchez, your hand was up. Did you want to ask a question? Okay, looks like we're good to go. Okay, great. Um, I know that um, Councilwoman Farrah Lewis was here earlier. She wanted to speak. I'm just double checking if she's still here and any other council members that might wanna join us. Okay, I don't see anyone. Um, okay, wonderful. This is a historic, um, Historic Muslim Day at City Hall, Hiba, that we actually finished. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> we did less this. than an hour. We did it in less than an hour this year, but we had really wonderful presenters um, that were really able to give the city uh, council and our participating members here a really good wrap up of what Thank we're you. seeing. I'm just sorry, year. Council Member Prina Sanchez is here and would love to speak if we can uh, give her some space. Of as course. Well. Oh, sure. Yes, yes. Please, please patch her in. Council member, you've been promoted and are welcome to speak whenever. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I just wanted to say hello. And on, on behalf of my colleagues, I was rushing after dropping off the baby this morning to, to try to join you for the press conference, but I didn't quite make it. Um, but just wanted to thank you for, thank you to all the organizations here and to our hosts for this briefing. It's, it's really helpful to see it all put together, um, topic by topic, issue by issue, ask by ask. Um, and I look forward to, to digging in and just con continuing to work with you all. You know, we have a great relationship in my office with the Muslim Community Center and many of the mosques in our districts. And I just want to, you know, uplift that. And uh, so I'm here to listen and learn and uh, just thankful for you all putting in this work to um, you know, help us do better. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for joining us. And we appreciate you taking the time. Time. And um, you and all of the council members, all 51, will be getting a folio that has all of our partners that have engaged in Muslim Day at City Hall this year, uh, which basically gives uh, an overview of the organization, its mission and vision, um, and its funding request um, to support. So we hope that you will 
uh, receive that and take it into consideration as you are making your budgetary uh, allocations for organizations in your district, um, as well as also uh, work um, with the budget budgeting team to make sure that our organizations not only get discretionary funding, but special initiative funding and speaker funding. Um, we so desperately need um, all of this funding to support our vulnerable communities, especially um, in this time, considering the uh, climate that we're all living in um, and the need for us to combat uh, Islamophobia and hate crimes um, that are actually plaguing our communities. Um, so thank you all. I'm gonna pass it to him to close us out. Thank you to all of our, our sponsors, um, uh, Shahana Hanif and Yusuf Salam, um, and then all the co-sponsors who were actually joining us here as well as joined us on the on the steps of City Hall. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our Muslim Day at City Hall partners this year, not only for all the work that they put into this coalition to helping us build out recommendations and really outlining the issues that are affecting Muslim communities and New Yorkers across the city that they serve. Thank you for the work that you do. Um, thank you for all the work that you put into giving services to the Muslim community that really matter. Thank you for being there to respond and to have uh, an emergency response really in supporting all the migrants that are out there and doing the work that we're unfortunately not seeing the city carry on. Um, we are so grateful again to our primary presenters today. Thank you so much to Hussein Yadaberry from MCN, to Yusuf Mubadis from Yama, to Salma Mohammed from Manika, and to Dia Basusan from Safna. And thank you to our sponsors, um, Council Member Yusuf Salam, Council Member Shahana Hanif, Majority Leader Amanda Farias, um, Council Members Chio Se, Althea Stevens, Alexa Avelas, Lincoln Ressler, Shaker Krishnan, Rita Joseph, and to all those that joined us today um, to support uh, Council Member Sanchez, Narcisse, and everybody that joined us for our presser as well today. Thank you. So we're going to turn um, the camera so you can see all of our partners who are sitting here watching us present so you can actually give them some love and appreciation for all the work that they do. I hope I get everybody here. Everybody wave. This is the cutest thing ever. Did I get everyone? Yes. Okay. What do we want? Funding. What do we want? <laughs> yeah. What do we want? Funding. What do we want? Now. What do we want? Come on, say ceasefire. When do we want it? Now. Awesome. Thank you all so much. And thank you to our tech team. Yes. From National Audition. Best. It's been wonderful today. Always happy to work with y'all. All right. Have Signing a great day. Off.